Well, it's been a season of neglect here in my container grown citrus grove in Austin, Texas. Things don't always go as planned in the garden and this year's citrus can attest to that. I didn't perform any of my own recommended maintenance and apart from a few rounds of foliar fertilization, these trees didn't get fed much over the course of the season. There have been some persistent issues related to scale insects and I went a little bit further than I normally do trying to control them. And just to keep me humble, the grackles came along leaving their mark on many of the fruit as they used the citrus oil to preen their feathers. It's time to give these gems some TLC before they cozy up in their high tunnel, safe from any freezing temperatures. What's up everyone? It's Scott from New Garden Road. I'm here to inform, inspire, and elevate you. Encouraging biodiversity and restoring habitat is my mission, one garden at a time. So harvest time is always the peak of citrus season and that comes throughout the year. One of the highlights for me this year has been the Sato Mandarin. I potted this tree up at the beginning of summer and it grew really well throughout the season. And I have a really unique variety of blood orange. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it honestly. I'll put the name of it on the screen and you can decide for yourself however you say that. But I can tell you one thing, this is a delicious fruit, super mild. And when you slice this open, it's not a dark red, but more of a light pink color. Truly unique and one of my favorite specimens overall. My ruby red grapefruit is one of the most beautiful specimens in my collection and it did set some fruit this year. I think that from a lack of regular fertilization, these fruit just didn't size up that well. However, they're very tasty. Just because this is not a giant ruby red grapefruit doesn't mean it's not quality flavor. Some of the heaviest producers in my collection are the kumquats, along with the calamondin or calamansi and the key limes. All of these trees bear smaller fruit and they'll do so several times a year. On average, two to two and a half times a year, I'm gonna be harvesting. And I can show you here on one of my Chang Shao specimens, it has more than one generation of fruit. And that's because both of my kumquat trees bloom several times over the course of the summer. So some of this fruit won't be ready until next spring. The calamondin is such a unique fruit known in the Philippines as the calamansi. It's picked when it's green, but the flesh on the inside is gonna be a bright orange. This is said to be a cross between a kumquat and a mandarin. It has a really tasty, flavorful rind. It's very thin. You can eat the rind on this one. Each fruit will have a few seeds and it's super juicy and tart. If you like sour fruit, you're probably gonna love these. It's just like candy. You can graze on them in the garden. It's really a conversation starter when you bite into one of these because the flavor just explodes in your mouth and it's super sour. I love the flavor of these key limes. I use them in beverages and to top different dishes. One thing to note about limes in general is you wanna wait until they actually turn yellow. You know, we think of limes as green and the flesh is a light green color, but when you harvest them, you wanna wait until they have some yellow coloration. That's gonna be the peak of their sweetness. And that's a great segue for highlighting my Persian lime. I mean, these fruit are so big and juicy, very sweet, and they don't have seeds. This has been one of the most abundant producers in my collection. My dwarf improved Meyer lemon is a big producer as well this year. These are said to be a cross between a sour orange or a mandarin along with a lemon. Some have tasted it and said it's kind of spicy. My Lisbon lemon is one of the larger trees in the collection and it's a little bit unruly. It requires some pruning seasonally just so I can fit it in the high tunnel greenhouse a little bit easier. Honestly, it's a tree that would get quite large if I planted it in the ground, but due to its lack of cold hardiness, I choose to continue and grow it in a container just so I can offer it some protection. Most of these trees get moved around on a dolly. That's really handy and easy for moving them in and out of structures or inside of a house. This Iranian lemon has really bared the brunt of the scale infestation that I've been battling over the course of the year. This is on dwarf rootstock. It's a really nice compact plant. I love the size of it in general and the fruit are huge. How about my Ujukitsu lemon? This is nicknamed the lemonade fruit. It really tastes like lemonade. It's not as tart as some other lemons. It has a unique shape and a little bit bumpy texture on the rind. My variegated pink lemon is one of my hands down favorites. It's just a beautiful tree. It's grown a little bit wild this season. It definitely needs some shaping up, but I'm waiting until I harvest the fruit before I do that. You can see it's fairly loaded up. The leaves of this tree are simply like paintings. Each one 
one of a kind, totally mesmerizing. The fruit themselves are just as unique. They've got some variegation on the rind, and when you cut them open, they're a nice light pink color. To me, they have some similarities in their flavor profile as the grapefruit, the pink grapefruit, or the ruby red. They've got that nice lemony flavor, not too tart or acidic, and they've got that grapefruit flavor in there as well. I don't know if that comes from the flavonoid specific to the pink color associated with this fruit, who knows? So now I wanna share with you some of my observations or takeaways from this growing season. Scale insects have been the absolute worst this season. I just have let it go and they continue to spread throughout my specimens. I did go quite a bit further than I normally do in treating them this year, utilizing spinosad and insecticidal soap. One of the reasons these scale are so tough to control is because they have this waxy coating and they're not really susceptible to a lot of sprays or other controls. Oftentimes, physical removal is the best course of action, but what do you do if you've got it widespread or if you have some really large trees? You know, most of mine are pretty small and manageable, but I understand if you've got a tree that's 15, 20 feet tall and it's infested with scale, how do you treat for that practically? So you might consider a foliar application. I really did several rounds of this, probably every three days for two weeks, just to really try to knock back that population. One of the things that I really wanted to do in tandem with that was blast them off with a strong glass of water. That can help to remove the insects themselves, and I think that would make them more vulnerable to a repeat application with the spinosad and insecticidal soap. So I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna break out my bug blaster and put it on the end of my watering wand and show you exactly what I'm talking about. So that might not get every single one of them, but it's gonna make a lot of headway. Probably gonna get a little wet, but I can tell you this has been really helpful to me. If you don't have a proprietary gadget like this bug blaster, you can use like a regular spray nozzle at high direct pressure, you know, right on those insects. You might have to get in there a little bit closer, get even more wet. Huh. Part of my philosophy that intervenes here is that there's a balance in nature and I will often see beneficial or predatory insects on my citrus trees. I know a lot of these insects are only going to do so much, so there's a balance and I'm part of that balance in my organic garden. When I see certain cycles or populations of beneficial insects, I'll hold off on applying any insecticides or even trying to blast things off with water. Many times over the course of fall and winter, I'll get questions regarding yellowing leaves on citrus trees. Don't be surprised if you see some yellowing leaves. You need to investigate and see if there are watering issues or pest related issues, but oftentimes you need to consider as the days get shorter, these trees don't need as many leaves in order to conduct photosynthesis, so they're going to shut some of them down. And they'll put on new growth as things begin to warm up in the spring. So the boat-tailed grackle is one of the common, you know, non-native species of birds here in the Austin area. And at a certain point in the summer, they really like my citrus trees, not for a good reason either. They'll come and peck on the fruit and start to use that citrus oil that comes off of the rind and they'll be preening their feathers. So don't get me wrong, I'm all about biodiversity and the relationships in nature and the balance, but this is just no good. I mean, come on, you know, I'm growing these citrus trees for these fruits. They're the gems of the trees, but there's not a lot that I have been able to do so far to keep the grackles from getting to the fruit. But in most cases, the fruit, the juice, the flesh is just fine on the inside. And one of the last observations I wanna share with you is my Bloom Sweet grapefruit. This is my only citrus tree planted in the ground and it's been about 10 years since I got it established. It's been through several hard freezes. The cold weather last February was completely ridiculous, but somehow, some way, I was able to get this tree through. And at the point I've got it right now, it's pruned up in an extreme way. But my goal was to encourage a nice canopy and something that would be easier to maintain over the long run. So I want to wrap up my update here talking about some of the winter preparations that I'll be doing for my citrus trees. Number one is I don't really want to feed them too much going into this portion of the season. They're not really going to go dormant but I also don't want to promote a lot of vigorous growth because in the event that we get cold temperatures even though I protect them that could leave them vulnerable to some stress. That new growth is going to be really tender. I'm just going to let them lay low 
and the thing that I will be adding will be compost. I love the Happy Frog soil conditioner. Generally what I like to do is remove any mulch that I have in my containers or around the base of my tree and add a nice layer of this compost. Just set it on top, let it work its way in naturally over time. That's really going to work to feed the soil at a low level. It will help to build up that soil a little bit over time because as that tree grows it's utilizing some of that soil and that mass that's in that container. You'll see them sink down. So adding a little bit of compost in this fashion will be good to help to continue to build that soil. Likewise you could use a nice potting soil. Just add about an inch of that on top. So the other thing is mulch. If they don't have a whole lot or if it's broken down I'll need to add some more. About two to three inches is going to be the average amount that I'll add. Pine straw or pine needles is my favorite mulch. It's really easy to water through. It'll break down and add to the soil over time. It's got a little bit of acidification properties to it so that's always good for citrus trees. I feel like it's a pretty renewable resource as well because it's just like using leaves only they're pine needles. The other element that I will use on my citrus trees will be seaweed, liquid seaweed. I'll apply that as a drench. That will really work to shield and protect them. It's really one of the best elements that you can apply in the garden. Take two. That's what we're going to do. Cut it out back there. I'm going to sneeze. What? Am I recording? Yeah. All right. All right. That's great. All right. That's great. It's time for a citrus date. Now check out more awesome gardening videos on my channel. Like this video and follow New Garden Road for weekly content. You can grow your own citrus fruit. Keep it organic.